Hey, I'm Andrew Hunt, and I'm really excited to talk to you about Good Robot, Efficient Reinforcement Learning for Multi-Step Visual Tasks with Sim to Real Transfer, which is being published in the journal RAL and presented at IROS 2020. So what are we actually discussing here? We're going to introduce the SPOT framework, which completes 100% of real multi-step test tasks, such as block stacking and row making after taking just 20,000 simulated training actions. To our knowledge, this is the first instance of reinforcement learning with successful sim to real transfer applied to long-term multi-step tasks with consideration of progress reversal. Now let's take a look at one of the key issues we're going to cover. You can see that the robot on the left is exploring open space, which is very unproductive. What we really want is a more productive exploration of objects like our algorithm is doing on the right. You can see that our algorithm is even making small stacks at a very early point in time. This is important because such a broad range of applications involves interacting with objects. So how do we achieve that? To start, let's have a little fun and talk about dogs, specifically training them. Typically, people need to ensure their dog, like Tara here, will be able to ignore certain things they're extremely interested in on command, perhaps a squirrel. One way to train them is by allowing them to explore in a safe environment. What you do is start with a high value treat hidden away behind you and another low value treat out front with both hands closed off. Basically, they'll smell something is there and explore your hand, but they won't have access. Eventually, they'll look at your face because they're wondering why you aren't letting them have that treat. And in that moment, you can swoop in and give them the high value treat while praising them good Tara. By repeating and extending this behavior, you can train them to ignore things on command which they'd otherwise go after. This is the principle which we're deploying in our algorithms. We allow exploration of the environment and provide zero reward when we know in advance that an action will not be productive. For example, in the stacking task, we know that grasping objects will be productive and grasping empty space will be unproductive. This is also true for a broad range of other practical tasks. Take a look at the navigation task. Here we know that turning might be productive depending on the direction, but we're very sure entering the lava is critically unsafe behavior. We also show that identifying progress reversal is key to learning efficiency. Like if that dog were to go for the low value treat, even though you commanded them to leave it. Here we have an example with three actions. The robot has already made a stack of two and here it grasps that yellow block then places it on top of the red block to try and make a taller stack. But the blocks are off balance and everything tumbles. That's progress reversal right there. All of your previous work is undone. So why does this sort of thing matter? Well, a lot of simple mistakes can be recovered from in omega of one actions, while more complex tasks can take omega of n actions to complete. So examples of these simpler omega of one tasks include table clearing, stacks that are two blocks tall, and navigating around that grid world with no exist existential risk. More complex tasks with omega of n recovery includes general assembly tasks, stacks of height n, rows of length n, and navigation with existential risk. In that last one, you basically end up having to start over at the beginning with a replacement robot, which is obviously extremely expensive. So now I'm gonna show a brief overview that introduces our methods and demonstrates some of our results. In order to learn effectively, robots must be able to extract the intangible context by which task progress and mistakes are defined. Our schedule for positive task, or SPOT reward, trains our efficient visual task model to complete multi-step tasks in which failure is highly consequential, in this case, the creation of four block stacks and rows. Our model uses RGBD visual input with the robot out of frame to predict pixel-wise Q values over grasp, place, and push actions at 16 discrete orientations. In this row example, you can see an overlay of the Q values used to predict actions. During training, the robot chooses the maximum Q value across multiple actions, occasionally exploring random actions within this space. We also introduce spot queue learning, where we dynamically mask the action space. If the global highest value is masked, we train with a reward of zero at that location as if synthetically executing that action. We then physically act at the highest unmasked queue value and train as usual. As you can see, our real world tasks include creating stacks of blocks, rows of blocks, and clearing varied toys. The last task is the simulation only grid world navigation task. Here's that slide with the pipeline again. We start with the image from the camera at the top left. We project it to an overhead view, and then we create 16 oriented versions of that image, which we pass through our pixel-wise fully convolutional neural network. That gives us predictions, <coughs> which we filter with the common sense constraints we described earlier, 
which restrict the action space we can actually utilize. Now we are up to the rendering of the pixel-wise cube values on the far right, which are red pixels for high values and blue pixels for value near zero overlaid on the rotated images, which corresponds to the 16 possible gripper angles and the three possible actions. Once we have pixel-wise cube values, we take the masked and unmasked arg argmax of the push and grasp locations and orientations. And that gives us a chosen action, like to grasp an XY location with a certain gripper, gripper angle. From there, you can follow this purple arrow to where we grasp the red block. Then the next action is to place on top of the yellow block. Finally, in the bottom left, you can see the final successful stack. We found that structuring the data as we have here means a single action is fairly invariant to the position and orientation changes. And this is part of why learning can proceed with remarkable speed. Another particularly interesting thing to really pay attention to is these green arrows, where we've got the same object in two frames. In the grasp frame, the yellow block has a low score, and this means it recognizes that it shouldn't grasp a block off the top of a stack. Then in the place frame, that same object has a high score, so we should place an object on top of this block. That's the sort of discovery which is really essential, and our progress reversal concept lets us discover these principles quickly. Now let's discuss spot queue learning, where we employ the common sense masks. We will start with standard queue learning, where you take the argmax of a queue function with a state and action, and then iteratively minimize the absolute difference between the queue value and the target value. Basically, you're trying to optimize the choice of action that will result in the best overall task outcome. So how is spot queue learning different from queue learning? With spot queue, we have a special case where an oracle defines the common sense dynamic action space. Then in the case where the queue function selects an impossible action, we basically get a free data sample at a location we know can train with zero reward, which brings us back to that dog story. So here's what happens while we're training with spot queue. We start with the replay memory, which includes the states, actions, rewards, and predicted actions from the neural network. While an agent is acting, you take a prioritized sample from your previous experience, and the priority is typically defined based on the distance between your predicted and actual reward. Then you run regular queue learning function and set up a queue for loss. Next, you pass your state through the forward network and then evaluate the result with your mask. If the mask is triggered, you know that the action would fail. So you get an extra free data point and create a new zero reward sample for that action. You add that to your delta T, perform back propagation, step the optimizer, and update the weights. We will actually discuss quite a few situations where zero reward is assigned. And it's worth pointing out the, the symbiotic relationship that has with experience replay, because the large distance between predicted and actual rewards means such events have a very high priority. To summarize spot Q, whenever the network chooses an action we know is not valuable, you give that action zero reward, as, as we saw in that dog training example. And then during experience replay, you train on the action which was actually taken in the past, while on the real robot, you physically take the best action, which the mask indicates is worth trying and then you continue on as normal. Again, the best part is that you basically get two samples for one piece of data wherever the network chooses a masked action. So why does this matter? Well, spot queue can accelerate learning with direct assistance from traditional algorithms. Now let's look at some comparison data in simulation averaged across the stacking and row tasks. We compare a dynamic action space with no spot queue, a standard action space, and a dynamic action space with spot queue. The 95 and 88% of trials are completed for the ablation cases, and with our algorithm, the number of trials complete jumps all the way to 99%. Our action efficiency jumps from 23 to 37, and then all the way up to 50% efficiency with our model. These are really nice results for just 20,000 actions. We should point out that the best sim models complete every single trial, and those are the models we transfer directly to the real robot. Now, let's talk about the spot reward which is how we evalu evaluate the key principles we've been discussing. Here we've got a sequence of actions where we're pushing, grasping, and placing as we try to create a complete stack. We've also got a plot of reward that comes out of this successful trial. We are going to build up the reward shaping function starting with a baseline from prior table clearing work known as VPG. From there, we will incorporate the principles we've discussed earlier and evaluate how they contribute to efficient reinforcement learning. The baseline multiplies a predefined action weight by an action success indicator, which is one if it succeeds, 
such as when the sensor in your gripper detects a grasp, and zero otherwise. Next, we have our progress indicator, which is a continuous value between zero and one, which indicates task progress. One means the task is complete. The example here shows four example states as the stack is assembled, where progress, grows, where progress goes from 0 0.25 with one block in height up to one for a stack of four. A progress reversal is when the progress function decreases. So if the initial state is 0 0.25 and you get up to a stack of three at some later state, then something knocks it over, your progress is reversed uh, as in state three here. In the case of a progress reversal, we perform situation removal. This harkens back to the dog example where we do a zero reward on progress reversal. The situation removal parameter is one if the progress is stayed the same or improved and zero otherwise. After that comes the progress reward, which multiplies the situation removal reward by the continuous progress state. Altogether, these form what we call the spot instant reward. Now let's go over some of its useful properties. Between steps four and five, you can see the robot knocks over the stack, so there is zero reward, since the situation removal indicator is set to zero. One key limitation of the rewards so far is that they are all instantaneous and cannot incorporate outcomes from far into the future. So for that, we have the spot trial reward indicated by the green line, which aims to address that shortcoming. It is defined recursively from the last time step, so, that, so it can only be collected after a full trial is run. R star is whatever instant reward you might prefer, but in the case of this paper, it is RP, the progress reward. The trial reward at the final time step is double the instant reward, and every previous time step gets a portion of the reward from later time steps. A nice property of this design is that a progress reversal triggers zero reward like it does in the instant rewards, which means reward propagation is cut off at that step. Let's compare the grasp and place actions at steps three and four, which come just before the stack topples, to steps seven and eight, which are followed by a sequence of successful actions leading to a complete stack. This gives us exactly the behavior we want because reward is higher for the successful sequence, even though the action and stack height is the same. Now we are up to one of our key insights because as you can see, the addition of situation removal leads to a phenomenal performance jump with 94% of trials complete. Then, as we add task progress on top of this, the rate grows to 97%, with an additional big jump in action efficiency from 23 to 45%. Finally, you can see that the trial reward has some training efficiency trade-offs. It is actually the best stacking algorithm, but the row-making performance was significantly lower. So combined, 88% of trials are completed successfully. We directly load the best simulation models for sim to real transfer and we complete 100% of both stacking and row trials with 61% and 59% action efficiency, respectively. We also evaluated real-to-real -real trials. We trained stacking for about 2,500 actions, which led to an 82% trial success rate and 60% efficiency. At the time result, the results came back, we were very excited to see that the sim-to-real model actually outperformed the real-to-real -real model, which is great because exploring in a simulation is lower cost and lower risk. In the 20 toys test, the spot framework matches VPG prior work with 100% task, task completion and improves both the rate of grasp successes from 68 to 84% and action efficiency from 64% to 74%. We are very happy with these results. But you know, manipulation on a table is a fairly specific kind of task. And this is why we implemented our algorithms in the safety version of the widely utilized grid world navigation task. Here you can see how the performance changes as a mask, spot Q, and RP is added. In the final case, with the complete spot framework, you can see that it learned quickly, completed just shy of 100% of trials, and ran with a fairly high action efficiency. It is also important to point out that our only failed trials are from hitting a 100 action limit, and the robot never entered the lava. We believe spot Q is worth exploring if you need to explore within action safety zones and learn about identifiably unsafe regions without actually exploring them. Now we should mention that there is still some future sim to real work worth looking into here. While stacking and row tests are able to transfer successfully, the pushing and grasping task does not. We suspect this is because the model is learning a lot from the depth data, and we mention a few approaches in the paper which might help close this gap. So in conclusion, our spot framework introduces methods for incorporating domain knowledge, which dramatically improves real world reinforcement learning performance across a broad range of tasks and identifies key principles for efficient training. If you're interested to learn more,
be sure to check out our code. And thanks for watching.